New Galaxy Broadcasting proudly presents Integrative Hermetic Health with Hugo Rodier, MD. In this program, we explore a powerful new paradigm for health from the standpoint of integrative medicine. In his practice, Dr. Rodier integrates the ancient hermetic art and the enduring role of food as medicine with modern nutrition, but also allowing for the wide range of important health practices, including truly valuable medical discoveries, chiropractic, acupuncture, homeopathic and herbal medicine. In this program, Hugo Rodier, an expert in intestinal health and nutrition, will help the audience discover an approach that focuses on actual cures, not the masking of the elegant simplicity of many health solutions for the sake of profit. Profit too long has been an overriding motive of the pharmaceutical companies, and sometimes, sadly, by many in the medical establishment today. This is Johnny Blue Star with the Integrative Hermetic Health Show with Dr. Hugo Rodier. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Johnny. And what do we have to discuss today? Uh, a couple of things. One is uh, C-sections, quite uh, popular these days. I remember when I was in medical school, we were told that over 5% C-sections was not a good thing, that they were being overdone, you know, because it's something you want to limit and you do when when you have to, you know, when the mom or, or and or the baby are in distress, you know, so of course you can save lives that way and we don't want the ratio to be zero. So 5% was quite livable back then in medical school in the 80s. Guess what it is now today? 30%. Close. It's about 25%. It varies depending on who you ask. So, well, human nature, I'm sure a whole lot of them are being done for convenience. You know, uh, you got a vacation coming up or the doctor's going to be out of town. Who knows? But um, they're being done a little too much. Oh, and then you get paid more if you do a C-section, et cetera. Et cetera <laughs> oh, right? no. Yeah. Well, of course. Well, I understand. So, sure. Yeah, you can see human nature at work, and I'm not going to say who's supposed to do it. I'm not qualified, but uh, in my heart of hearts, I think they're being overdone. But uh, one of the problems with C-sections is that they're thought to be totally innocuous or benign without any deleterious consequences down the road at all. And of course, that is not true. So, Johnny, let me let me have you try to guess. What do you think might be a, a big problem down the road with kids, babies that are born C-section? Can you give it a shot? What's wrong with the babies, right? Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to have higher index of issues. I'll take a guess. Something related to trauma. No. In fact, they're less likely to have trauma because they skip all the squeezing and and shoving and pushing. <laughs> and so they're, they're less likely to have trauma. Well, I'm batting 50-50 then. Well, turns out to be the gut bacteria of these really? kids. Yeah, because think about it. We get our gut bacteria from mommy and that's the way it is and for good and bad. And so whatever gut bacteria mommy has is what you get mostly as you pass through the birth canal. So when you're born C-section, you skip that very, very significant moment of your life. So a whole lot of these kids born C-section, their gut bacteria is different. And as you know, our gut bacteria is two-thirds of our immune system. So guess what these C-section babies are prone to do? To get more ear infections, to get more sore throats, and who knows what else. And guess what these kids start to get with more ear throat or uh, ear infections and sore throats and a little cough? What do they get more of? Uh, uh, they, they, get, they, they get antibiotics. Antibiotics. Which affects the microbiome. Right. So you can see your immune system, the microbiome gets beat up more and more. Pretty soon, they're having acne. Oh, and throw in a bad diet, high in sugar, which is likely in America. Pretty soon, they start to have acne. So what do they get? Antibiotics. And pretty soon, they wonder why in their 20s and 30s, they start to have autoimmune diseases and gut problems, irritable bowel. And who wouldn't you know it? It might have started with a section. So that's one of the big questions I ask my patients when they come in with all kinds of immune issues, gut problems, where you're born C-section. And this article just came out this month, but we've known about this for decades. I have to say, I'm kind of astounded by it. I mean, you're talking about a minute or two and they lose out their, their protection for the rest of their life, really, unless they can fix it. 
the microbiome. Well, well look, well, exactly. But uh, look, I don't want to make it sound too dramatic because there are other factors like what the health of the mom has been. Did she take antibiotics? Was she eating a good diet, lots of veggies? Is she going to breastfeed or not? Where does she live? Is she going to be stressed out? So you, th- you throw it all in the hopper and what you get? I'm just saying this is one of the factors. No, I, I understand. Yeah. This was published in the journal Nature. So it's not like this is uh, fly-by-night research here. They followed six, 600 babies. They looked at 1,600 uh, bacteria, stool bacteria samples. And so how about that? That's really interesting. Yeah. But before we move on to um, the articles you found, uh, Johnny, let me tell you patient's experience. And it's, it's worth telling. This poor patient got uh, major surgery, life-saving surgery. And uh, the doctor, the surgeon was very good, exceptional, in fact, right there at the hospital. Great, great service. But wouldn't you know, the patient goes home, starts to have all kinds of complications. Poor patient cannot find the doctor, not answering calls for three days. Patient's having complications, leaves messages, nobody answers. Two days later, the doctor on call calls. What's going on? I'm afraid this is a little too common. Human nature, again, at play. The other day, I helped my daughter with a mortgage. Boy, the guy was just great, really good at the bank. I mean, exceptional. We get the mortgage. We start to have problems. You think we can raise this guy who helped us with the mortgage? No, cannot be raised. Why? Because he already got paid. He already got uh, thousands of dollars worth of commission, so did the surgeon. So anything after that, it's just a nuisance to some of these people. Yeah, that, uh, is, kind of, that is kind of a shame well, when you're dealing with critical things. Well, yeah. I mean, you can see it in the mortgage guy. But a doctor, you know, to abandon you like that when you're having severe problems. Look, I'm not above human nature. I, I can see it. And, and, you know, and I make an effort after the fees paid, you know, to still be of service and, and answer phone calls and texts and emails promptly before I go home the next day. Anyway, it's just human nature. And I think it affects all walks of life, including our, our health care system. So I just thought I'd throw that in because I, me and the patient are upset about it. Well, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Well, in my impression of really hours of discussing different things with you, including some details of of how you became a doctor and what happened, wouldn't you say it very clearly that you had a calling? Oh, well, thanks for asking, Johnny. Yeah, you're a man after my own heart. Now, my question is, though, how many doctors have a calling? And could they operate the way you just discussed if they really had a calling? You know, I cannot answer that question. Let me just tell you my impressions, you know, which may be totally wrong. Yeah. But uh, as of my class, most graduates went in specialty care. And the numbers are pretty clear. 80% of medical students go into specialty care, 20% into primary care, like uh, internal medicine, pediatrics, family practice, psychiatry, OBGYN. Guess what the numbers should be? I said 80-20, 80% specialists, 20% uh, primary care. 80-20, the opposite. Anyway. Exactly. What's going on? Look, we need specialists. I'm not saying we don't. But this overemphasis on specialties, well, it's understandable because a whole lot of these graduates come out with horrendous student loan issues. So they want to pay them back quickly. And I, I don't begrudge anyone that. But uh If we want to be socially responsible, I think it should be the other way around, just like you said. And so what is the motivation of a whole lot of doctors? I'm just going to leave it at that. Let me just speak for myself. I felt called to medicine. And one of the biggest things that is that I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to help people understand reality, our society, the humanities, our own selves, know thyself. I think that's what leads to true health. And that takes time to motivate patients. You're not going to motivate people with 10, 15 minute visits and give them a bunch of drugs and run home. So I spent a lot of time with patients. I fired insurance companies because they do not like you to spend time with patients. And so speaking for myself, yes, I felt called to medicine and I chose family practice, which and I earn about a fourth of what the regular doctor earns. But you know what? I live comfortably. I take naps and I sleep very well. So there you have it. Well, when I grew up, I think that the, I may be wrong because maybe I was sheltered, but I really thought the, and we're talking about the 50s and the 60s, say, 
Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm hundreds of years old. Yeah. So, anyway, I always felt that the doctor was like a special, special person, like a fireman or a policeman that were putting themselves on the line for other people, and that was their primary motivation. That was the image I had. I don't know if it's true, but that was definitely how I felt. Now, now I don't think anybody probably has that same image after they get their bills from, the, from exactly. a lot of the medical doctors. Well, we have to take a break now, and we'll be right back. This is Johnny Blue Star, CEO of New Galaxy Enterprises, a media content development company. Want to write a book but don't want the challenges of developing time-consuming social media platform, costly private book promotions, complex email campaigns, and advertising commitments? If you write a book about your business, you don't need a mass audience. Focus on prospective clients with the best business card there is, your own book. To learn more about New Galaxy, see samples of our work, or talk to us about your project, please go to www.newgalaxyenterprises.com and fill out the contact form. It is the 15th century. El Tesoro de Cielo, a Spanish treasure ship, sends a scouting expedition to a strange island. Golden statues surrounding them prove the enormity of their find. Suddenly, hordes of foolish creatures with scaly green flesh and skeletal wings descend upon them from the sky. What do you think of this, Rufio? These creatures are fragile, Captain. We can take them with our swords. They seem supernatural. Who knows what powers they possess? Fallen angels weakened by their treason. My God! Are you saying they're Nephilim, the devil's host? I'm saying whatever they are, we can take them. Do any of you cowards dare join me? Up against sharp knife-like nails and hideous fangs, the men's swords rip into slimy green flesh. Though black blood pours copiously from their half-naked bodies, the creatures miraculously persist. Can the crew survive this bloody, cursed battle? Find out more by googling The Thrice Born, a new sci-fi supernatural novel by Carlos Lopez Avery and Johnny Blue Star. Google with the words Carlos Johnny Kendall, The Thrice Born, that's Carlos Johnny Kendall, the thrice born. This song is an expression of human love going beyond the common and casual into a momentous fusion of one human heart with another. This next song was composed by Edgar Ahrens and performed by Patricia Welch. I wrote the lyrics. Those crimson waves, a 
We're back on the air with the Integrative Hermetic Health Show with Dr. Rodier. And doctor, I have had a very significant experience. And that, that is that I am really trying to be on what I call the Rodier diet. And that means I eat very little meat. I eat some fruit, but I do eat meat. I have a lot of vegetables, uh, raw and cooked. And um, that's sort of the direction I'm going in. Uh, now, I noticed, as I've told you uh, f- for a few weeks, is that if I eat a little bit of the wrong thing, I'm kind of hooked. So, I was really desire. I got so upset with myself, I actually sort of started to pray about it. <laughs> and really, honestly, I mean, I, I believe in prayer, but I believe sure. in meditation probably more. But But if I get really desperate, I'm not afraid to pray. And I came up with something which I'm not saying is original, but what I did next is, I, I, what I said is, I'm going to have a list. And I didn't make this list out completely, but I thought about this list. And it says like, okay, you're about to eat some ice cream. Well, is this good for you? Well, sometimes I might say, well, it's sometimes good for me, or it's never good for me, or it's always good for me. And usually, you know, a lot of times... There'll be times when when I'll actually ask that question about something that's maybe good for me because I think I might be eating too much of it. So, I ask question, okay, what are the symptoms you're going to have if you eat this? What are the long-term symptoms? What are the immediate symptoms? Why don't you want to eat it? What's going to go, what's going to happen? And I start to interview myself about this for a little bit of time. And you know what? By the time I'm finished, it diminished a lot and then disappeared. And this happened three times. And I love ice cream. And I wanted that ice cream. But the, and the desire was very intense, but it diminished. What do you think? I didn't have the ice cream. Well, yeah, I have a lot of thought, a lot of ideas about this. Number one, who doesn't like ice cream? We grew up with ice cream. We love ice cream. It's very social. And 
I would want you to have an ice cream if you're walking down the Champs Elysees or hanging out at the Colosseum in Rome, a little gelato. <laughs> I have to go overseas to have some ice cream? Well, no, I mean a special occasion here and there yeah. with your fam yeah. once a month. You know, you should not begrudge yourself a, a little pleasure like that. So we don't want to be fanatic about it. Number two, we talked about the microbiome, how it can send you messages for you to eat the wrong thing if you got those bacteria in the guy used to a certain diet they they want you to keep feeding them that way and we talked about the cartoon i have posted on my website uh, hugorodia.com about that very thing i didn't eight minute cartoon number three awareness a lot of it just wolf down a lot of uh, food without even thinking about watching tv or etc so that's why sitting down and having a good discussion with family members chewing slowly increases your awareness to where you can t- Tell what food is doing to you. And that's what you did. You became very aware and you took the time. And so you got uh, messages from above rather than below, if you <laughs> if you have my meaning. So, right. yeah, those are all great points. And I congratulate you on it. Well, I mean, the idea was the dialogue was the dialogue that I had. Yeah. It took the time. Exactly. To do, and and I, I, in other yeah. words, reason was overcoming microbiome, negative microbiome programming from these devilish little creatures that are uh, affecting my brain and addicting me. (laughs) Well, you know, that's the story of mankind, you know, know thyself and who are we? We're, We're spiritual beings in a carnal body. And so if we're ruled by passions, either our tempers, our egos, our lust for power, our uh, desire, gluttony, yeah, it's not going to go well for us. It might be momentarily pleasurable, but uh, that's that's the dilemma of our lives. And since we talk about hermetic medicine, you know, this is worth discussing. And we're to rule our passions. We're to let, to uh, make an effort to have, to live by that spiritual voice, to have our spiritual nature overcome, subdue, govern, control our carnal desire. Mm-hmm. And this is symbolized by a whole lot of emblems out there. Uh, each religion will say it differently. You know, the the carnal man and et cetera, et cetera, and different ways to say it, masons, you know, the square and the compasses. Uh-huh. But it's all one thing. And you alluded to it and you were able to subdue your passions. Congratulations. Well, that was one time, though. Because I actually had a whole day where I would say I did, I, I did really a hundred percent. I mean, there was some gray areas, maybe because I ate a lot of quinoa, maybe more than I should have, but it didn't affect me. And um, I don't usually well, eat that much quinoa, but anyway, it was there, and there was vegetables with it. But that's it's, wonderful. That's, yeah, that's what I tell patients. I tell patients, look, if you got this uncontrollable desire to eat ice cream or something doughy, reach for a potato, uh, reach for. A cashew ice cream. Uh, reach for a crutch, if you will. It might not be the best, but at least you're getting Mother Nature's sugars instead of artificial sugars. And if you keep at it, pretty soon those those cravings will go away. And yeah, if you keep having this dialogue, pretty soon it'll be effortless. Well, thank you. I appreciate you talking to me about it. There's an article that you sent me about, oops, erectile dysfunction. Yes, um, uh, hit below the belt. <laughs> you know, guys, we worry a lot about that, particularly after a certain age, you, even though young guys can have erectile dysfunction too. And it's just funny how most people think of it as just a very localized issue below the belt and leave it at that. But uh, we've known for decades now that it's just the tip of the ice, that erectile dysfunction is a shot across the bow warning you that your entire circulatory system is under siege. I mean, think about it. Why would only one part of your anatomy show circulatory problems? And that's what an erection is, a circulation issue. And so if you have any erectile dysfunction, I'm sorry, but don't shoot the messenger here. You're likely to be going down the slippery slope of circulatory problems. And so what seems to be localized should be warning you. The next might be angina, a heart attack, or a stroke. And I don't want to alarm anybody about this, but uh, that's what we're about, prevention, you know, avoiding problems. So when you're having problems with hydraulics, you have to think beyond that. And so pretty soon you'll start to think about these basic things. Eat your veggies, get off sugar. So pretty soon you'll look at a Twinkie or ice cream and tell yourself, okay, 
is is it worth eating this Twinkie and this ice cream if I might have erectile dysfunction? You know, that's a good comparison right there. I mean, that should motivate a lot of men to get off the ice cream and the Twinkies. Well, this uh, this article that you're talking about is talking about a, a analysis of over 150,000 men, which is pretty nice size, at that, yeah. and predicting the risk for a future stroke of heart attack. But also, this is uh, amazing. This is the article that was published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, and it shows that compared to men without symptoms of impotence, men with erectile dysfunction have a 59% higher risk of coronary disease or arteriosclerosis, and a 34% higher risk of stroke, and a 33% percent higher risk of dying from any cause at all. That's amazing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And, and what's amazing is that we've known about this for decades. And I'm glad that articles keep coming up to remind us. And It's still a very large study, right? I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, this is thousands of people from way back. It's yeah. not that article. Yeah, I know. I know. But I mean, it's still, there's a lot to document this, right? Yeah. Well, another thing is, uh, we, we had, remember we were talking about daytime naps and we were talking yes. about how the, the risk of Alzheimer's disease, you know, the, this article was sort of saying, well, there's evidence that it might, and we, we were talking about the, the nap, you were talking critically about the article to some extent saying, but don't forget that that's only a minority and daytime, not, daytime naps may be actually good for you. And there's an article that's uh, a research that's been do done on daytime naps may be linked to lower risk of heart attack or stroke. And this is an actual study. Well, we've talked about it and it's worth reviewing my point uh, back then when people got scared to death about taking a nap. Again, was because when, when your nap is induced by eating a lot of sugar, yeah, of course, you know, you're triggering an insulin release a spike. And that insulin goes to the brain and it fries your brain. So, yeah, the higher risk of uh, Alzheimer's when you're napping because you ate a pot full of macaroni and cheese <laughs> or a big pizza. Yeah. you. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking <laughs> well, in the mirror, but I would never eat macaroni. I hate it. But uh, well, there are uh, multiple other things that make me go to sleep. Almost everything that's bad for me. So, so that insulin release induced nap is bad for you. So, the article... Yes, has a point. The problem with the article is that it lumps all naps as the same. And I'm here to tell you, if you take a nap after lunch, a very light lunch of a salad and some fish, and you naturally fall asleep because you follow the rhythms of the body, you're relaxed, you're reading a good book, that nap is good for you. And it was triggered by following the rhythms of your body. To, to sit there and struggle trying to stay awake because you're going to die if you nap, that's ridiculous. And so, yeah, a whole lot of articles will tell you how good it is napping. And now, full disclosure, I grew up in a Latin culture, French and Spanish, and I love naps. And so do my forefathers. And you tell me, who are the healthiest people on earth? The French and the Japanese. Well, the Japanese don't nap as much. Feel sorry for them. Well, th this article actually says that that people who took one or two daytime naps had this lower risk. In other words, they don't necessarily have to nap more than that. Well, yeah. some cultures they nap every single day, right? In like Mexico, uh, Latin America. I mean, right, and the French too, and, and out in the countryside. But uh, look, their rhythms got used to that. Okay, and so yeah, you do well to follow rhythm. And uh, and I nap about five times a week. I, I do lay down every day, but about twice a week I don't fall asleep. But I'm content to just sit there and read my book. Other days I sleep for an hour, other days for 30 minutes. It just depends on what I've been up to, how I slept the night before, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just don't sweat it. I, I just let nature take its course. I can tell you, though, I don't eat a heavy carbohydrate lunch to induce sleep through uh, that insulin spike. That is bad. Well, we're going to have to take a break now on that note, and we'll be right back with the Integrative Hermetic Health Show. My company, New Galaxy Enterprises, is a California corporation specializing in the creation of media and promotional content. We are focused on original, innovative projects that are good for humanity. These projects could be nonfiction books or novels, fictional screenplays or documentary content, websites and website content, commercial advertising content for print, audio or video products on the internet, television or radio, musical scores for advertising, television or film, video, audio editing, etc. We want to promote products and projects that support the environment, encourage a healthy experience in living, 
developing, nurturing and useful technology and offering platforms for positive, socially constructive entertainment or informative, transformative media. Our experience in creating a variety of products like this is rather vast, and we offer client-based and collaborative products, as well as the opportunity of active investors to join us in the creation and promotion of proprietary products, some of which are in latter stages of development. For more information, go to www.newgalaxyenterprises.com. That's www.newgalaxyenterprises.com. If you're interested in talking to us, just fill out the contact sheet and we will get back with you. Dr. Hugo Rodier has published four books on health issues covering practically all chronic health problems. You may find them by accessing his website at hugorodier.com. That's H-U-G-O-R-O-D-I-E-R.com. Gut health is the most academic, while switching off chronic disease is the most patient-oriented with simple recipes to implement his nutritional protocols. Now this next song is by the amazing band Lightstorm, this time about the unity within ourself with the infinite oneness of the universe contained in the very core of the divine presence, the I Am.
Hey, this is Johnny Blue Star back with Dr. Hugo Rodier, who is the host of the Integrative Hermetic Health Show. And uh, I was I watched this incredible program w- with Joe Rogan, who was interviewing Mel Gibson and a doctor who was uh, from Texas, practiced in the United States, but spent one third of his time in Panama because he was dealing with stem cell issues. And in this program, and there are many things that he said. It was uh, quite incredible to me, anyway, that Mel Gibson got involved in stem cell therapy, particularly eventually because of his father, who was 92 years old and failing in every way possible. Couldn't walk. His his mind was, uh, you know, cognitively impaired, probably his heart, his pancreas, all kinds of functioning. And he put him through this program and this guy, this this ninety two year old man who's now a hundred came out whole. Most of his functions functioning was repaired, and I thought that was startling. And there were a lot of details in this, and a lot of discussion of other things. What do you feel about cell stem cell therapy? Well, uh, number one, I'm happy for Mel Gibson and his father, and we hear a lot of examples like that. And I would never like to keep anyone from trying particularly if you got a disease that is not responding to anything. Yeah, you should try everything, even go to Mexico and try this and that. I, Yeah, hope springs eternal. And so don't take my comments to be discouraging. But cell stem cell is not ready for prime time. And any good doctor will warn you about that. And so we are insurance companies are not reimbursing, are not covering it because for every success story you tell me, I'll tell you 10 failures where people got ripped off at uh, boutique clinics where they do this. They're not well regarded in the medical community. I do not recommend it at all unless you've got a lot of money, you're willing to live with failure. Look, in theory, it makes perfect sense. So does a whole lot of other things. For instance, checking your genetic material. Your, your DNA and, and then doing this and that, this and that to prevent some genetic disease. Well, you know, that is just the wrong way to approach things. Let me just talk about DNA real quick. We'll go back to stem cells. Okay. But it turns out that uh, people who really get into DNA and checking their DNA and genetic tendencies totally forget about epigenetic. Epi meaning above genetics. And so I can tell you categorically that you can have the most horrendous genes, but if you eat your veggies, stay away from sugar, you're very unlikely to have those bad genes manifest themselves, period. 
back to interesting right so we we get a whole lot of the theoretic uh, ways to go about uh, healthcare but they're all very expensive and pushed by doctors that i feel are into it for the money if you're truly truly there to help people you would focus on simple things the low hanging fruit if you really want to help people you know for one percent of the country to be spending a whole lot of money on this and that, this and that, anti-aging on this and that, this and that, and then leave the rest of the country with no money to buy food or a simple test like a pap smear. As a society, that think that I think that's very wrong. Again, stem cell theory is right on, and I hope in the future it is so well developed that every attempt, as expensive as it may be, will yield results enough for the common folk to be able to profit from this very promising field. Yes, and I hope that uh, Mel Gibson's dad's experience is able to be replicated and used at every level of healthcare, not just the rich boutique people and doctors. And so I bet you money, if you start to look into it, you will see that stem cell clinics are catering to the super rich or the fairly rich, et cetera. Well, I think that's true. But uh, th- this particular gentleman, they're doing research there in Panama. They can't do the research here because some of the things they're researching are not open to them right now. One of them was umbilical cells, umbilical right. cords, uh, stem cells, which apparently have been having much better success. Some of these cells that they use aren't actually growing something again, but they're repairing uh, different uh, different organs throughout the body. Well, absolutely. I mean, like I said, uh, the theory is terrific, very exciting. I would love to have this be reproducible to the point where we're not wasting a lot of money. But let me just tell you my own experience with it. Yeah, sure. I'm not going to mention the name of the company, but uh, they recruited me early this year. Very excited to find that I, to see that I practice the way I did and they were very welcoming and paid me well. And so we're tacking along. They have good products, a nutraceutical company and consulting. I'm consulting for them. And then they wanted me to endorse their new product, which is stem cells by mouth to be absorbed through the gut and heal all kinds of gut problems. And not only that, but throughout the body. I said, I'm sorry, I cannot endorse you with that. As much as the theory is very good, I think you're going to come across as very quacky, as very flaky. I cannot endorse you. They drop me like a hot potato and they run with that product. I predict that company will not do well. Oh, okay. So they're taking, they're, are they taking stem cells orally? Is that it? There's no evidence whatsoever. But that, that's what they're doing, right? Exactly, because it's gimmicky. They're eating, because, they're eating the stem cells. Right. So, you know, a whole lot of people uneducated will see, oh my God, stem cells. Oh yeah, I want to buy them. And of course, they'll market themselves as, yeah, look, look at the research the research here. Look at Ben Mel Gibson's father. Yeah. And so they'll fork out a lot of money, but I don't think they will be returning to buy more. And any company that markets a product that doesn't have return customers will not do well. So I could not endorse them. So I left. They left me. They were upset that I wouldn't endorse that product. You know what? They told me everything I needed to know about that company. So good riddance. Well, I want to turn to another one of your articles that I have a problem with. This is uh, the article on mushrooms. (laughs) I find this article to be really, I mean, maybe it's just because this article is... um, It's just sort of a a summary. Because how can they do investigations on mushrooms and prove that that mushrooms don't have a whole bunch of different negative effects on people, okay? All kinds of things, particularly in this case, it it was uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, or diabetes risk. So how can they say that mushrooms, instead of talking about species of mushrooms, how can they make a generic thing like that when mushrooms can have all kinds of different effects, including, as you know, hallucinogenic? Is that serious? Yeah, Yeah. but it goes to show you how articles get published. And uh, if you don't understand very basic things about uh, research and nutrition, that uh, you can be misled. And this article that you bring up was published in a very good journal, which I like, Mm -hmm. the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. But uh, it's very, very flawed because of the point you make. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, <laughs> the mushrooms can be very, very far out things. Right. Number two, this article totally ignores the microbiome. And remember how we've talked about how a food will affect you this way or that way, good or bad, according to the gut bacteria you have? Yeah. This article makes no mention of that very important fact. And so our gut bacteria is the ultimate arbiter to how any food, any chemical, even drugs. In fact, the whole pharmaceutical industry has to go back to square one and retest every drug if they truly want to be scientific. And they're not going to do it, I can guarantee you. If they truly want to be scientific, they would rerun all their drug studies and with an eye to see what kind of bacteria an individual person has in the gut and then see what effect that drug has because of the bacteria and how the bacteria in the gut tells the liver how to detoxify that drug. This is the science of postbiotic, how any chemical, any food is modified by the bacteria we have in the gut. And so that goes for food, including food allergies. We've talked about that. So it's a bit of a flawed article. Oddly uh, enough, the, the the next article that, that, you know, we don't have much time left, but just to mention it, it says diet quality is associated with microbial diversity and host health. But what it's trying to say is that the relationship between the microbiota and host is influenced by several factors, including diet. So if you have mushrooms, they're going to affect they're going to actually affect the, the microbiome uh, as opposed to, say, uh, carrots. There could be, a, you know, striking effects depending on the species of mushroom and all that. But uh, so it's not just what what's in the microbiota, it's what you're putting in your body because that's going to affect things too, right? Through the diet. Well, sure, it's a vicious cycle. If you, you eat a good, bad diet, you're going to have bad bacteria. If you have bad bacteria, it's going to influence your diet. And there you go. And you can spiral down and down and down pretty soon. You're sick and you're having gut symptoms and you have the inflammation leaking out of the gut because of that disorder, pretty soon that inflammation leaks out of the gut and goes everywhere and there you go. So yeah, those two are good articles to point out this very simple fact. Well, we have to uh, unfortunately take leave of each other this week. Uh, I hope you have a really great week. And um, what do you think we'll be discussing next week? Um, something fun. How about that? A whole bunch yeah. of research and new articles and new breakthroughs, sure. right? Yeah. And our own experience with medical issues you we brought up a couple of things and yeah we like uh to bring it down to earth and make it so that people identify with the issues we bring up well you take care doctor and um we'll see you next week all right thank you johnny the coalition is a unique project designed to empower its members both individually and collectively besides individual empowerment its broader focus is on the restoration protection and enhancement of citizen and human rights throughout the world through the aid of its members. As this project is centered in the United States, our first task is to create a website and social network infrastructure to promote collective efforts to take back our rightful control as citizens over our government as designed by our founding fathers. Although we must begin with the social network restricted to United States citizens, the organization will also host a global dialogue for the discussion of human rights by citizens of democratic nations throughout the world. If you're interested, please check us out in the GoFundMe.com website, entering in the search field, the Coalition for Planetary Empowerment. That is, go to GoFundMe.com and enter in the search field, the Coalition for Planetary Empowerment. For more information about Dr. Rodier's practice, books, blogs, and newsletters, Contact Hugo Rodier, MD, at www.hugorodier.com. That's H U G O R O D I E R.com. We go out with a song whose melody is as beautiful, touching, and nostalgic as its lyrics. Misty colored memories, scattered pictures of the smiles we left behind the way we were.
pictures of the smiles we left behind, smiles we gave to one another for the way we were. to remember 